Hi and welcome everyone. We are live with our last session of the 2020 UC Master Gardener virtual mini conference. Welcome everyone to the room. We already have 51 people logged on you guys. This is a great. I have three other people in this lovely room for me and they are all from Santa Clara County UC Master Gardener program. They are lovely volunteers who are going to be talking about their third place winning project for the search for excellence. I'm so happy to have him with me here today, especially since, guess what? This is all new for some of us and challenging and just a little nerve wracking, but we're happy to have everyone here feeling happy, being great at what they're gonna do, and just here to tell you about a project they love and adore and know all about. Um, we have people already chiming in in the comments of where they're from. If you haven't watched yet, I'm logging in and coming to you live from the Yuba Sutter area up in Northern California. I'm in my home office hanging out with some pumpkins, been hanging out with most of you all week. And guess what? We've been having nothing but a good time. So please type in the comment section where you're from. We do have people joining us from, I think I saw someone in our last session from North Carolina. So, hey. Welcome. We have people from all over. We have um, UC Master Gardener volunteers. We have public. We have family that's coming on and embarrassing people. So if you told your family members that you're gone live, they may come on and embarrass you. It's happened. I'm looking at certain people through the camera. But anyways, we are about to get started and I'm going to pass it over to the lovely Elizabeth in just a second. But hey, guess what? I'm Lauren Snowden, I'm the statewide training coordinator, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this search for excellence. Well, guess, guess what is great about this whole thing? This is a competition that takes the best of the best and shoves them to the top of the pile and wants to just show them off. This is one of those opportunities that only comes around every three years. So we really appreciate the people that take the time, put in this application. And guess what? This year we had 14 applications. So that is 14 separate projects going on across the state of California that they thought were in competition for this this prize. And you guys won third. So congratulations. You're in very, very, very good company. So the search for excellence is an opportunity to celebrate and showcase the tremendous talents of our UC Master Gardener volunteers from across the state. A panel of four judges reviewed and scored the 14 applications this year, and they really wanted mission-focused, educational, and innovative projects performed over the last three years. So not a brand new project, something that's had time to, you know, marinate, had time to improve, and really show some impacts. And one of our judges commented on this project and said, this this project is clearly successful and beloved by the community. Congratulations on a wonderful and highly sought after project that greatly impacts youth with both gardening and nutrition education. Uh, you guys should be really proud of yourselves. Everyone who's worked on this project and been a part of it. It's, um, it was really great to read about and I'm very happy that we get to share it today with all of you. We have 95 people joining us now. Welcome, come on in, you haven't missed a thing. And Elizabeth, on to you. All right. Thanks so much, Lauren. And thank you all for joining us. We're really excited. Uh, we're so honored to have won this award and we're thrilled to be able to share it all with you. As Lauren said, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a master gardener here in Santa Clara County. And I'm here with three other master gardeners, uh, Pam and Mildy. They are the ones who actually created this program. And then we have Jill, who's in our chat room, and she works with Pam and Mildy. So mornings at Marshall Cottle Park, lessons in the garden for school children. So first, I want to go over a little bit about what I'm going to what we're all going to talk about today. Uh, first, the UC Master Gardener program and what we do in Santa Clara County. A little bit about Marshall Cottle Park, which is where we hold the field trip program, what the objectives are, a little bit of the background and how this all came about, how we communicate with the school and the teacher and any follow-up that we do to help improve the program, the structure of the field trip day and how it's organized, We'll go in depth on the teaching stations. And then we'll talk a little bit about our future activities. And a bit about what we're doing during COVID. 
The UC Master Gardener program is Santa Clara County. Advice to grow by, ask us. There's over 300 master gardeners in Santa Clara County. So we're one of the larger programs in the state. We provide research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices to the residents of Santa Clara County. Now, historically, we've provided this through in-person events, classes, workshops, and library talks. Of course, now almost everything has gone virtual, which has been a little bit of a silver lining for us. I used to do the library talks, and boy, was I lucky if I had 20 people show up, maybe 30. But now we have 100 people coming, kind of like today. And even in one case, I heard we had 300 people. We also have a help desk where you can call us or email a website, our monthly newsletter called Tips and Events, which has uh, timely seasonal, well, seasonal tips, and then the events uh, mostly online right now of what's coming up. We also have demonstration gardens throughout the county. Uh, in the north in Palo Alto and all the way to the south in Gilroy. Our largest demo garden is in Marshall Cottle Park. And that is where we hold our field trips. Marshall Cottle Park is a gem of a park in Silicon Valley. And if any of you live in San Jose or in Santa Clara County or are coming through, I highly recommend that you go visit this park. It is so unique. It's it's so different than any other park. There's no playground. There's no playing fields. It's just incredible vistas of the valley, what it would have looked like 150 years ago. If you look off to the east, to the foothills, you see the golden grasses and the oak woodlands and Mount Hamilton. You look to the west and you have the, the Santa Cruz Mountains and the towering redwood trees. This land had been farmed by the Cottle Lester family since the 1850s. And in 2003, Walter Cottle Lester donated the land to the state and to the county on the condition that the property would be developed into a park that informed and educated the public about the agricultural heritage of Santa Clara Valley. As I said, it is a unique park in the fact that it also has park partners. There's Jacob Farms, which is farming 180 acres of the land still. 4-H has about eight acres. They have cows, chickens, goats, and in the springtime, they'll get lambs. There's the UC Small Farms, the Santa Clara County Composting Education Center, Our City Forest, they're just now beginning to build a community garden for the local residents. And there's the four acre Master Gardener Community Education Center. Now we've been working on this parcel since about 2015. So just a little bit over five years. And we've been able to accomplish quite a bit in that five years. We have a native gar California native garden garden. We have a habitat garden with a pollinator hill. We have about 80 raised beds with garlic, and flowers, and all sorts of things growing in them. We have another pollinator garden where we bring the children on the field trips to. And we have a three sisters garden, which is another garden that the children get, have the opportunity to walk through. And then another the water wise garden is our Mediterranean Mediterranean climate garden that has a recirculating waterfall feature in it. Our most recent garden is a succulent garden. There's also an orchard with about 70, 60 to 70 trees, almost all of them donated to us. Marshall Connell Park is also our growing grounds. We have shade houses, a greenhouse, and a hoop house. And of course, it's also our education center. So in the photo, you can see our covered pavilion. This is where the children and teachers and chaperones gather before and after the program. It's also where we have one of the field, um, 
one of the teaching stations. Mornings at Marshall Cottle Park is an extension of our public education program. It was a field trip designed specifically for second graders and supports the life sciences and nutrition education. It's available to schools near Marshall Cottle Park and those in low income communities throughout the county. And as you can see by the photo there, it takes a lot of Master Gardener volunteers, community volunteers, and Cal Fresh nutritionists to make the program such a success. So how did we come up with this program? Well, it really came out of discussions with the Parks Department while we were applying for a grant from the Santa Clara County Open Space Authority Measure Q grant program. At that time, we were meeting with the park on a weekly basis. We were telling them our ideas and how we wanted to develop the park, our parcel. And the park was sharing their information and some of their challenges. And one of the things that came up was their field trips. So we thought that maybe there was a way that we could help them with their own field trips. So we saw an opportunity where maybe the park would provide the historical and cultural education while the UC Master Gardeners and UC Cal Fresh Healthy Living folks would provide the nutrition and science lessons in the garden. So with the funding from the Open Space Authority, we were able to build a teaching pavilion and provide bus transportation for Title I and schools in low-income communities. So in 2017, when we actually got the funding, we recruited Pam and Mildy to create a garden-based curricula. Now we literally threw them into the fire because they just graduated the Master Gardener program and we asked them to please come up with this great uh, field trip program and you have two months to do it. Well, they took on the challenge. And as when our original vision was just maybe a one hour program where they would spend an hour in the garden, uh, with the master gardeners and then the kids would go over to the park, Pam and Millie had a much better idea. Being former teachers, they knew how to create a really robust field trip program. So in the fall of 2017, we piloted the program. The children came to our parcel. They spent the morning with the master gardeners and the nutritionists, got lessons on life science and nutrition. They had lunch at our pavilion, and then they walked over to the park where they spent the afternoon learning what life was like on a farm in the early 1900s. They even have a cut out cow with realistic udders and milk and they had an opportunity to milk the cows. But it didn't take long to realize that that was not going to work. This co-program, it was much too long for the kids. Uh, spending the morning with us and then the afternoon with the park was just too difficult. Plus there was a conflict with fees. Our program was free and the park wanted to charge the for the program. So in the spring of 2018 through the fall of 2019, we were on our own. 25 classes with 590 students and 261 adults from seven different schools went through our field trip program. In the spring of 2020, we had already signed up 10 classes for five weeks we were turning schools away because we just didn't have the manpower. And then COVID hit and all field trips were canceled. But that didn't stop our educational outreach. And we'll talk about that a little later in our presentation. So I'm gonna pass this over to Mildy and she'll talk about the school communication and follow-up. Thanks, Elizabeth. 
as Elizabeth said, we had our pilot program in the fall of 2017. Pam and I had been master gardeners for about three months at that point. Um, and we decided that we needed to do a little training with the master gardeners, the community volunteers and the park partners before we held this field trip. <clears throat> we decided that we would hold a workshop for them where we would discuss our objectives. <laughs> we would discuss the four stations and what we were going to do. And we would demonstrate the ideas we were going to be teaching through a multi-sensory approach. We emphasized fun, scaffolding learning, and accessibility so that our English language learners, our special education students, and high achievers would all get successful at this field trip. Um, since Pam and I were retired teachers and had extensive special education backgrounds, and knowing the three schools that surround the park having special day classes, we also gave some instructions on how to deal with special needs students, such as keeping directions very short, using lots of modeling and visuals, not touching the students, that some students might be very uncomfortable with touch and sound and smell, and that was okay. If they needed to back away, that was fine. One of the chaperones would stay with them and encourage them to come back. And this happened during our field trips because yes, we did have very specialized students coming to the park with us. So what did we do? Well, once um, after the field, the, after the pilot field trip, once a school um, wanted to come, I communicated with the schools and Pam communicated with our master gardener volunteers and our community volunteers. <clears throat> so I would send letters to principals introducing our program since it was a brand new thing to the schools surrounding the park and other schools in the area that we knew about. Pam and I happened to teach in that school district, so we were pretty familiar with the schools that surround the park. Um, we also used the nutritionist to help us with the Title I and low-income schools that they supported. So they would talk to the principals there, and they then would I, give my contact information, and I would contact the principals and talk to them, and they would put me in touch with their second grade leads so we could, could um, set up these field trips. Once a school committed to the field trip, I would send them the guidelines for the trip, such as what they would need to bring, how they needed to divide the students, how many parent, adult chaperones they would need to recruit, what they should and shouldn't bring that day, what they should wear, <laughs> what it would be like in the park. And then about two weeks before, I would send reminders to the teachers of all this information, including the need for a snack in the middle of the day and I'd give them contact information for one of us during that day. I'd also request their contact information in case there was a problem that day. And then the day before the trip, I would again send them an email and contact them with my contact information, reminders of where a bus should park, or if they were walking to the park, where I would be meeting them. And then that morning, I would meet the, the bus or the walkers and bring them to the park. Before they came into our gates, we would always remind them that they needed to walk, that they might see some wild animals running around. We have rabbits and gophers and squirrels and snakes and who knows what running around the parcel. So we would remind them not to go running after the animals. After the field trips, the teachers and chaperones completed a survey, which I collected before they left the park. And then the <clears throat> Pam and I would go over this with the volunteers and make any changes that we needed to or improvements, and I would follow up with teachers if that was needed as well. I would then walk the, the um, classes over to the area where they could go to the bathroom and have lunch before leaving the park, whether they were gonna walk back to a school or get back on the bus. And now Pam, I'm gonna send this over to you for the structure of the day. Thank you, Mildy. So typically we want the students and uh, chaperones to arrive at our park at nine o'clock. In a real world, in a perfect world, they all do arrive at the same time at nine o'clock on buses, in carpools or walking. The reality was quite different and the most important thing for us was to be flexible with our start times. Um, initially, when the kids arrive, they're carrying backpacks and lunches and sweaters and 
who knows what else. And in the process of walking from the bus or the sidewalk area, they are giving all these things to the grown-ups, and they are arriving at the teaching pavilion and sitting down with me. I keep all the children, which is about 50 children at a time, and Mildy takes uh, the grown-ups, the chaperones. Um, she gives them a little mini in-service on what their role is for the field trip, encourages them to only use cell phones for photography, tells them it's a hands-on experience, and she also gives them just a highlighted information about our programs, passes out bookmarks with contact information, and encourages them to come back and visit the park. So while she is talking to the grown-ups, I am telling the kids the highlights of the four teaching stations that day, and then we are talking about the do's and the don'ts. And in the slide, you'll see a drip pan behind me as I'm talking with my hands. And right now I'm squeezing them so I don't use them because you can't see them anyway. But um, we have a do and don't teach chart up there. And the kids read the rules with me and then decide if it's a do or a don't for the park. And they put either thumbs up, thumbs down, or yell out do or don't. And we go through some rules, things like touching things at the park, chasing, stepping in beds, sniffing, smelling. We go kind of through the basics because it's different rules than in a classroom setting. And so we try to get all this accomplished in 15 to 20 minutes. Before the children arrive, they're divided into four groups by their teachers. And usually it's a heterogeneous group. Um, they are each named a beneficial insect. So we have the honeybees, the butterflies, the ladybugs, and the dragonflies. And I call the children out by their beneficial insect group name. And we introduce them to the master gardener leading that activity. And they line up with that master gardener and the master gardener's helper or community volunteer helper. And off they go to that teaching station. So uh, once we are all underway, Mildy is our timekeeper and she sets the time. And fortunately for us, they gave us these gigantic school bells when we retired. And we said, we could have used these 35 years ago, but we figured out we can use them at the park. So we use our bells and that signals transition time for change between the stations. So ideally we like to have 25 minutes per teaching station. And we get a five minute warning bell, and then we have five minutes to line our kids up and have them travel on to the next station. And while they're traveling, we're usually doing some type of review from the lesson that was taught at that station. So we go through two rotations, and then we pause for a quick 10 minute break, and we hope that everybody has a tiny bit of snack to keep their energy going, a drink of water, we also hope they don't need to use the restroom because we have only an outhouse in our parcel and it's a longer walk to the park restrooms. So then uh, the bell rings again, then we line them up again and we finish the next two rotations. That usually takes us to about 1130 or so in the morning. After the final rotation, all the kids come back to the pavilion area, sit down, they're usually all bubbly, kind of tired. Um, and excited about what they've done during the morning. We do a little kind of closure review activity for each of the stations to review the learning. Um, kind of, you know, we've told them what they're gonna learn, we've taught the lessons, and now we're sort of reviewing the objectives. So for example, for the nutrition station, the nutritionists and I would ask them about what they learned about eating the different colors of vegetables, I have these gigantic cards. I don't know if you can see them or not. Here they are, gigantic cards. And I will say the first part, like orange veggies help me and they have to shout out, see better, keep my eyes healthy. So we have a little fun response that's either a, a calling out response or a standing up and doing something response. The favorite one, of course, is from our insect anatomy station. We have a very fun song. It's fun to do it slow. It's even more exciting to do it fast. And it's very fun to show off 
for all the grown-ups. So all the kids stand up and sing. So that's kind of the structure of our field trip. And now the next slide, just gonna talk about our different teaching stations. So when we first got this job, we were just asked if maybe we'd help design these different activities. And um, we said, sure, we would help write this curriculum. So we looked both at second grade at, um, life science standards and we used the UCCE nutritionist objectives and their manuals and materials. And we tried to mesh things together to create this four station program. At that time, we did not really think we were doing the program, but the person that kind of nudged us the first part of it moved away and we inherited the program. So we were underway. So we have the plant life cycle teaching station. We have a nutrition teaching station an insect anatomy and adaptation station and beneficials and pests in the garden station. So those are our four teaching stations. And Mildy is gonna talk about the first one next. Oh, go Mildy. Thanks, Pam. So the first, one of the four stations, it's never the first station, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter where the children start, they get to all four stations if we're lucky. So the plant life cycle station, we begin by bringing the children to the table and talking about what it means to be a life cycle, how things repeat themselves over and over again. And we use real pictures that we've taken in the garden of the plant life cycle. So we have pictures on popsicle sticks that we stick into egg cartons. And we talk about a seed and roots and sprouts and stems or vines and leaves and fruit and flowers and seeds. In the fall, we use pumpkins as our example in our pictures. And in the spring, we use sunflowers. After we've talked about what a life cycle is a little bit, then we talk about what really is happening, that the seed, inside that tiny seed, there is a seed coat and an embryo and nutrients. And that's really where life will start but that the seed needs things. It needs sunlight or some kind of light and warmth, and it needs water to begin to grow. And when it does begin to grow, it sends down roots and the roots begin to take, um, take nutrients from the soil. It needs to go into the soil and it sends up a sprout. And, and the sprout is the beginning of life for the, for the plant. And we talk about things like germination and what does that mean? And what happens when the roots and the stems begin to grow? And I go cut a pumpkin from the garden so that they can feel that stem and how prickly it is and feel the leaves as they're hairy and different. And they love this. And then we try and make sure that we have a female flower on there and a male flower so they can see the difference that the female flower has the little fruit attached to it. And in the spring, we take out sunflowers heads that we have dried and saved from the year before so they can actually see the seeds in the head. And later on, we'll use those seeds to plant new sunflowers in the garden with them. We talk about what it means photosynthesis and what pollination means. Um, and the children really enjoy that. And after we've discussed this with pictures, we then, next slide, please, we take out what we call our pizza activity. So we have, we have copied these pictures onto construction paper and laminated them and cut them into a pizza pie. And we've also taken clothespins and written the words on them. So the children start out in pairs working together. One child holds the pictures and the other child holds the clothespins. And we start with a seed and they put the seed on and they find the word seed. And then we find the roots and the same thing happens. And after four pictures, we have the children switch jobs. So the one who had the clothespins now gets the picture and the one who has the pictures now gets the clothespins. And they continue through the entire life cycle till they've made their pizza. And before they can clean up, they have to tell an adult what the life cycle is. If they finish early, we have extension questions that the adults can read to them and they can try and answer where they can go surfing for these questions in our coffee cans 
filled with coffee beans and they pull out these questions. They have to clean up the same way they, they um, got their activities. So one of the partners has to put the clothespins back on the cardboard that it was on and the other one collects the pictures and puts them together neatly. And they put all the activity into a Ziploc bag. In the spring, the students come out into the garden to one of the garden beds and help plant a sunflower from one of our sunflower heads. Each student gets to plant one sunflower and also gets to plant a second sunflower in a pot to take home with them so that they can grow their own sunflower. We encourage them to come back to the park all through the summer to see how their sunflower is growing. In the, in the fall, we have our three sisters garden and the children get to come and see what the three sisters garden is all about, where we have corn, squash, and beans growing together. And we've set out our own little special pumpkin patch, except our pumpkin patch includes gourds and edible winter squashes, as well as pumpkins. Next slide. Next slide, please. Elizabeth, next slide, please. <laughs> the children really love the Three Sisters Garden. We've been doing this for the last two years, and it's so exciting to watch what they're going to pick. Many children decide that they, they can get a pumpkin other places, so they choose a squash or a gourd because they've never seen that before. Before we allow them in the garden, I tell them the story of the three sisters. This is a legend from the Cherokee Native Americans. There were three sisters. The first one was tall and had long yellow hair, and her name was Corn Girl. She grew tall and upright and strong but her feet would get sunburned from standing in the field all day long, and she was very hungry. The second sister was very fast, and she was good at making food, but she wasn't very strong, and she couldn't stand up on her own. All day, she sat in the dirt, wishing she could grow tall, and her name was Bean Girl. The third sister was plump and round, and she was very hungry. Her name was Squash Girl. The three sisters never, ever got along. One day, Bean Girl said to Corn Girl, if you're hungry, why don't I feed you? And you can hold me up so I don't get dirty. Corn Girl agreed, that was a great idea. And she was no longer hungry. And Bean Girl was no longer dirty on the ground. And Squash Girl said, well, why don't I sit by your feet, Corn Girl, to keep them in the shade so they won't get sunburned. And in exchange, Bean Girl can give me some food too. The three sisters learned to work together, and this is why Native Americans always plant their bean, corns, and squash together. Corn keeps the beans off the ground so they don't get diseases from the being too wet, and the beans have that special ability to, to take nitrogen um, from the air and put it into the soil, and corn and squash use the nitrogen as food, and squash has great big leaves to shade out the weeds and keep the soil cool. <laughs> the corn and the, the beans that we grow in the Three Sisters Garden is dried. We gr grow popcorn and we grow dried beans, so we're not constantly picking things. And that is our plant life cycle station. And now Pam's going to tell you about our nutrition station. The discussion about the plant life cycle station Mildy was out in certain areas, certain garden areas at Marshall Caldwell Park. And we try in each teaching station to take the children to a different part of our garden. So for the nutrition station, the first thing we do is go out to our raised beds where we have been growing either fall or spring vegetables. And we have the kids around the bed and we harvest vegetables with the kids. We let them touch them, smell them, try to guess what they are and talk about them. We do that for a few minutes. And then while we're talking to the children, um, we have one of the chaperones writing each child's name on the edge of a compostable uh, salad bowl. And when we finish in the garden portion, we then give them the salad bowls and they go over to a couple of buckets of soil and fill their salad bowl with soil and then come sit down at the table. And you can see in the last picture uh, the result of what they're doing. Um, at this station, we, um, could I have the next slide? 
to show them. We have a grab bag with um, vegetables in it, all different kinds. These vegetables represent all different parts of a plant that we can eat because we want the children to learn that you eat all different parts of a plant, you eat all different colors of vegetables and why it's important to eat all different colors of vegetables. And we've used many of Gail Gibbons books for our science-based events and teaching stations. And so on this gigantic drip pan, which is our magnet board at Marshall Caldwell Park, we have uh, laminated the page, some of the pages from Gail Gibbons' book, and we're using them to support the visual learners. And we're grabbing out of the grab bag and sorting these vegetables into a tray that's labeled root, seed, stem, leaf, flower, fruit, that type of thing. And while we're doing that, the kids are being given the seed that matches the vegetable that we've grabbed out of the grab bag. They're planting the seed and they're labeling it with a popsicle stick. So the popsicle sticks conveniently come in all these colors of vegetables that we want them to eat. So they get the right color stick, they write the name on the stick, and they put that next to their seed. So we have a little vegetable bowl, a bowl with their mini garden in it. It's put in a little baggie with a twisty top at the end. And we talk about how you take care of your miniature garden. And while we are doing this planting activity, we are also talking about the uh, different uh, benefits of eating different kinds of vegetables and the nutritionists are helping with that. Um, they wonderfully always prepare a little baggie of washed and cut up vegetables for each child to have. So at the station, uh, we have a hand washing station set up so that we're following surf safe guidelines and the kids are getting to taste the vegetables that they have planted that they've seen us harvest in the garden. So they take home their salad bowls from this station with a little mini garden ready to go. So may I see the next slide please? This is a picture um, of the different cards that I use. This is a picture of the nutritionist helping in the middle. And then if we have time, there's another extension activity. We have the kids make a little bracelet and the bracelets put together with, you know, five different colors of construction paper slips and a hole punch and a little rubber band so they can wear it. And on the, each color strip, like for instance, if they have an orange color, they're saying, you know, they're thinking, what does orange do for you? And they could draw eyes to remember that they're gonna see better. They could write the word see. So they're filling out these little notes to take home. And their job is to teach their families why it's important to eat the five different colors of vegetables. So that kind of wraps up the nutrition station. I'm gonna pass it back to Mildy, who's gonna talk about the next station for us. Thanks, Pam. <clears throat> that next station is the Insect Anatomy and Adaptation Station. Pam and I keep saying when I'm teaching, but actually there are two master gardeners at each station and we never know exactly who's going to teach what station, but we have developed these stations. <laughs> so we say when I'm teaching. Um, <clears throat> and it helps to have a second person with you because there's always too much to do at each station. <laughs> so the Insect Anatomy Station starts by bringing the children to another part of the garden. And we have a chalkboard out here where somebody is drawing the beginnings of an insect. And we're talking about what is an insect and the children are naming different insects that they, that they can think of and you're hearing all kinds of things. And as she starts to draw the head and the thorax and the abdomen, somebody will say, well, what about spiders? And we have to tell them that spiders are arachnids and only have two body parts, a cephalothorax and an abdomen, and that they have eight legs and insects only have six legs. So <clears throat> we try and give them lots of information at this station and slowly as the person who's drawing draws the head, then they say, now what's on that head? Well, hmm, on the head we have eyes, compound eyes. What is that? And this year we inherited something from one of our former teaching partners. So we'll be able to actually show students what it looks like to see through a compound eye. 
Um, and then we talk about the antennae and the different mouths. And then on the thorax, we talk about how an insect has two sets of wings and then six legs and spiracles, those holes on the side that help them to breathe. And the abdomen is a big part in the back, but it really doesn't have very many parts on it. And we talk about an exoskeleton, that huge word. And what does that mean? That the bones are on the outside or the shell is on the outside. But we don't have shell. We don't have an exoskeleton. We have a skeleton on our body. And to help this make sense to the children, we get everybody up and we have a little song to sing that Pam and another teacher wrote many years ago. And everybody seems to love this song. So my friends, help me sing, <laughs> sing this. It's to the tune of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And it helps imprint this information for the children. Ready? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Eyes, head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. We have part two, and we spread our legs apart. We go, wings, and legs, and spiracles, spiracles. Wings and legs and spiracles, spiracles, exoskeletons, wings and legs and spiracles, spiracles. The first time we sing it, we go very slowly and talk about all these words. And then we speed it up and we speed it up and we get the adults to help us too. And then we bring them back to the table for the really fun activity. Next slide, please. Elizabeth, thank you. <clears throat> so the next part of this activity is to make an insect out of Play-Doh that each child gets to take back with them. So we start by giving them a paper plate and asking them to write their name on it. And then each child gets a baggie with a ball of Play-Doh in it. And we begin by telling them they need to use all that Play-Doh to make the three body parts of the insect. And we repeat again, what are they? The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And think about what we talked about on each of those parts so that you don't make a teeny tiny little thorax. You gotta get a lot of things on there. And the adult chaperones are helping the children make this. And I'm whoever's teaching the station is modeling, rolling that Play-Doh into three balls and putting them together on the plate. The children love Play-Doh. Most of them have not touched it since preschool, if then. So it's a really fun time for them. And then we bring out our doodad plates, as you can see in the middle picture on the top. It has buttons and little gear, little things and clothespins and small um, pipe cleaners and things that we can make wings from and colored wire and all kinds of things that we've collected. Um, from a place usually called Raft, we have here in San Jose, which is a um, use, teachers get to go shopping there for crazy little things. So we've always been able to use that. <clears throat> and then we start with the head, modeling. What goes on the head? Eyes. How many eyes does an insect have? Two eyes. And they get to choose what they'd like for those eyes. And then the antennae, and they can choose different things to make the antenna. And then we talk about the mouth. And this is where we'll talk about the different mouth parts that insects have. The proboscis, which is on your butterfly, your bees, and your moths. So they sip it up like a straw. And we have a little straw there to show them that. And how <clears throat> mosquitoes have a pierce and suck proboscis where they'll pierce something and then suck it up. And um, how flies sop it up like... <laughs> like on their diptera mouth. And we have a sponge that shows that so they get the idea that it's a sop it up. And how mandibles, and they usually use the, cl the small clothespins for the mandibles because mandibles are for chomping and chewing. And beetles, caterpillars, crickets, grasshoppers, dragonflies have a chomp and chew or a mandible mouth. So they have to decide what mouth they'd like to put on their insect. And then we move to the thorax where they have to put two sets of wings on. And then they have to figure out how to get their six jointed legs on. 
And then we have rocks or many of the children have taken the beads with a hole in it for their spiracles and put the legs right through the spiracles where they put three on each side to represent those spiracles. And then we have these containers that have popsicle sticks again. Can you tell we like popsicle sticks of different colors where we've written the different body parts. And we ask the children to pick four sticks and then they get popsicle sticks and they get to label their insects using the models of the words that we've written on other sticks. If they finish, they can certainly label more, but nobody, <laughs> we never have extra time. <laughs> we seem to run out of time very quickly. When that morning bell rings, we hurry up and try and finish up. We get the parents to collect the um, plates and put them into containers we have. Usually they're, um, they're the box tops from Costco labeled with the teacher's name. So when they leave, they're already sorted by classes since the classes are mixed. And then we move them on to our last station, which Pam's going to talk about, our pests and beneficial station. Hello again. So um, our pests and beneficial station initially just talked about insects in the garden, but since COVID has come along, we've been tweaking a few things and keeping ourselves busy. So we've expanded this station and now it in general talks about what's beneficial in a garden and what's a pest in the garden. So we begin, once again, these are gonna look a little familiar. Yes, I love drip pans. At Marshall Cottle Park, we often have a weather that feels like we're in a wind tunnel and everything has to be secured so it won't blow away while we're teaching. So these photographs um, are magnetized and put on our drip pans. And now we talk about the four good peas that are in the garden. So the four good peas are predators, pollinators, parasitoids, and poopers. And we say, well, the grown up word for poopers is decomposers, but for this field trip, you can say poopers which is always fun in second grade. Probably the teachers are shaking their heads, but we like to have a little fun. So we talk about what, why those four categories are beneficial to the garden. And we also talk about um, other kinds of predators that are out in the garden and how they are beneficial as well. So we'll talk about birds or small mammals that are beneficial, reptiles, that type of thing. So those are the four good peas. And then of course, there is the one bad pea category pests. And we talk about insect pests first and that insects are pests, either eat your garden, eat the food you wanna eat, or they harm something growing in the garden or they harm you. So we are including things like mosquitoes and ticks, um, things that might spread viruses. Uh, and then we expand it beyond insects to include those slugs and snails and small animals like ground squirrels and even those cute bunny rabbits that do harm in the garden. So we give the lesson about the four good peas and the one bad pea. And we talk about how all these insects are together in the garden and how they work as an ecosystem and they have to be balanced. Um, next slide, please. So after we've given the introductory lesson, and I will say this lesson is a little aerobic because we demonstrate what a parasitoid is and somebody has to be the caterpillar laying on the ground and somebody has to be the parasitic wasp and lay an egg on the caterpillar. So we try to be as kinesthetic as we can to teach this station. So after we've done the intro, you'll see an orange cafeteria tray and that's literally what it was. We got a stack of cafeteria trays donated and we said, what can we do with these trays? Well, they became our little mini tea chart sort of sorting uh, tables because we are out in the park sitting in a circle of stumps. We have this very fine seating area. And on the left side of that tray, is beneficials, everything that's good, and on the right side, the pests. So the kids sort insects. If there's time, we also have the cards that represent all the other things in the garden, the other critters that they can sort in addition. 
So they do that activity for a few minutes, and at that time, there are master gardeners, volunteers, chaperones, kind of working outside of the stump circle and helping the kids. And then there's one chaperone that is writing names of all the students in that group on the center picture. That center picture is called a pooter jar, named after the gentleman who created it, or a bug sucker jar. So what it is, is a paper straw with cheesecloth, two squares of it, carefully taped around the inside end of that straw, and then a piece of fountain tubing coming out the other hole in the top of that container. That is a tennis ball tube container. I happen to be a tennis ball player and I have a great group of ladies and gentlemen friends that save these for us to use at the park. So uh, we demonstrate how you can suck a bug, an insect, into that container and not get it in your mouth because the kids are worried they're gonna eat an insect, which is kind of fun to tease them about it a little bit. and. Um, so we demonstrate by trying to find something under one of the stumps or on the ground. If we can't find a live insect, insect um, which is highly entertaining because they do move fast and we end up kind of filthy at this station from trying to get them. In our pocket, we have a secret insect called rice. And we pull out the rice and we suck up the rice to show them. Before this trip ever starts in the morning, we've already gone out into the garden area. We go in the ornamental beds and out to the South Fence Pollinator Garden and we flag areas where we can find insects so all the chaperones helping us and the community volunteers can spot these flags and take kids to the areas that seem to have a collection of insects in them for that day. And the kids collect their insects. And you can see in the third picture down in the corner kids sucking up insects. Now, I will say we have the most success sucking up aphids because they move very slowly. So everybody can always get an aphid in their bug sucker jar. At the end, we talk about what you do when you catch a beneficial insect. Well, of course, you have to release it back to the garden where we want it to stay. But if you catch a pest, you get to stomp it, which is very exciting. And we have another portion to this lesson now that we've been in COVID, we've kind of added something else. So I'd like to show the next slide, please. Here it comes. There it is. This is our IPM, <laughs> Integrated Pest Management. And we teach kids what that means. And we've picked out seven different strategies for it. We have the doors initially closed and we open door number one. What do you do to get the good guys to come? and it's called plant to attract. And we have little props to act out each of the activities. So we go through all these, you know, plant to attract, stop, pick off, squish, um, spray with a hose, trap them with newspaper, um, spray them with soapy water. And we just talk about all these strategies and the bigger notion of why you don't use chemicals and sprays in your garden is who is going to die. And the kids really get this, that there are these other alternatives. And we ask them to go home and practice these and do at least three and show their parents how they can help control the pests and, and promote beneficials visiting their own yards and gardens. So that kind of wraps up our four teaching stations. You can kind of tell we've squeezed a lot into every single station. Um, we would rather have too much than not enough to keep kids busy. That's our kind of just teacher background coming out. So I'm gonna talk about the next slide, if you'll show that one. And that is what we're doing up doing now. So I alluded to it a little bit before, is that we're looking at all our stations and we are now learning how to make YouTube videos. So at this point, um, we have made vermicomposting and composting videos, and we have made a pest and beneficial video, and we're almost complete with that, and then it will go through the approval process. And of course, on tap, we have the plant life cycle station video, we have an insect anatomy video, and a nutrition and salad bowl planting video that we'll be making. And we're hoping that the teachers and schools that we normally host at the garden will be able to use these videos and use us as a resource to teach 
in their classrooms if we're not allowed to host um, in person at the park. And even when we are allowed to host in person, the videos will be great for any child that's sick and misses a field trip because we can send a to-go package and they can watch the video and kind of catch up with whatever the rest of their class is learning. So that's our school field trips. And we also have a couple other types of workshops. We have a native bee workshop where we talk about the anatomy of bees, about three different types of special bees that live out in the garden, and we show them to them. And uh, we also talk about pollination and why bees are so important for that process. And uh, we've been very fortunate to have a host of wonderful bees visit Marshall Cottle Park. And we've even found the little home of a little green sweat bee. So it's an exciting workshop. It lasts about two hours. So uh, we've had some homeschooler groups that have done that one. And then uh, coming soon will be um, our compost workshops in the garden setting. So that's kind of what we've been doing during COVID, keeping ourselves busy, getting ready to share it all with you. And we do want to extend to you that we are happy to answer questions and invite you to the park. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, you are having lovely, lovely comments that are coming in. Um, I do want to say that we have had Jill working in the background and she has been uh, answering questions. She is part of the UC Master Gardener program in Santa Clara. So she's been answering some questions. But um, Elizabeth, I was wondering if you could unmute yourself after you're done drinking. Of course, I asked you as soon as you take a drink. I apologize. Um, could you talk a little bit about your guys's budget so unmute yourself and just tell us a little bit about your budget and maybe how much per class it actually costs to hold for uh this group of second graders that you guys see i unmuted you go for it all right <laughs> got it um so um basically um Part, uh, I think it's about $200 a year is what we budget for it. But um, Pam and Mildy have really uh, been able to go out and get um, a lot of things for free. And we're also able to work with the OSA grant program to provide some of the funding for us. But there's kind of an ongoing cost and then there's just one time cost. So um, maybe Pam and Mildy actually could, could um, uh, speak to that a little bit more. If you guys like to unmute yourselves and talk about that a little bit more, Pam, let me un sure. go. Okay, so uh, being teachers, we know how to work with very little money. We did it our whole career. And we beg very nicely for things. And people are very willing to help you. I beg for everybody's leftover coded electrical wire for insect legs. I beg for tennis ball containers. Um, and people just bring stuff once they've been at the trip. The teachers or parents will say, I cleaned out my closet. Here, take this. I'm sure you can use this do, Dad. And uh, our fellow master gardeners are very generous about giving us all the plants from the growing teams for our beds that we can grow. So um, we've been able to really run on a very small budget. It, there is some initial cost for the teaching materials, but the consumable ones are very minimal cost to us. Plus we use dollar store and oriental trading, which helps cut the cost too. So um, I, oh, sorry to interrupt. I had, um, I had the pleasure of reading your guys's application and then writing a blog post about it. Uh, would you guys talk about the transportation costs and how, how you guys worked, uh, worked around that issue? So that came from the OSA grant and there was a total, I think $2,000 for the, for the program. Correct, Elizabeth? So it just depends what school is coming, how far away they're coming from. The most expensive school um, was about $500 and the least expensive was about $350 for a bus. That's two classes and paying the bus driver for the day. So the school would 
actually requisition through their own transportation department and then send us the invoice and we would have a check for them. Great, thank you, Pam. I'm sorry to cut you off before, please no, go ahead. I think that's covered. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Um, we do have just like some other great comments popping up on the screen for you guys. You should be very proud. We are happy to have such, um, such talented volunteers like really there's everyone from every background that can come into the uc master gardener program and really find a spot for themselves and it's great that you've been able to take your uh your uh, ingenuity and your begging skills that you've learned from being a teacher and retired and brought them to something else and are still able to give back not only uh to yourselves and and um and like furthering your volunteer experience, but also to your local community that you have worked with and um, been with before. So we really do appreciate you guys having such a an open attitude and coming back to work with children and tying it back into that nutrition component. I'm not sure if people picked it up, but you're actually working with um, University of California Cooperative Extension Nutritionist. So it's really a marrying of programs. You're working with the park, you're working with other extension personnel. It's just, it's amazing what you guys have really done by pulling resources that are right there in your community and finding those partners that are like, yeah, this is a great project, but we want you guys to do it all. Well, okay, well, how can we really make this work? You guys have taken it, owned it, and made it work. It really supports the mission of the UC Master Gardener program. And I, I, I swear when I saw that little bug catcher pooter jar thing, I laughed because I'm like, you just made gardeners for life. Like those kids are going out and they're like, I know what this aphid is, it is bad, I'm taking it off. They're going home and telling their parents, I can catch bugs. Like it's, it's this next generation of people and it, it takes people like you, it takes programs like this, exposing people who may live in an apartment, who may not have someone in their family that gardens. Um, I mean, sometimes what, what what is a garden? It's your patio. Well, that's great. Guess where aphids go? They go on your patio too. You're creating mini gardeners. They see how to grow a salad bowl. Like it's... It's amazing, and I do have to say that I'm kind of, I'm kind of digging the Play-Doh activity a lot. So, as, as UC Master Gardener volunteers, you go through uh, 16 weeks of training. I could see, uh, I could see adults doing the Play-Doh thing because I mean, you say they haven't touched it since kindergarten. I haven't touched Play-Doh in a very long time until um, about a year ago at a baby shower, and I was so excited to touch Play-Doh. So. I'm, I may have to bring that back as an activity <laughs> for actual adults. Uh, we, uh, we, we do have on the screen up, you guys, everyone out there in uh, the virtual land, how to stay in touch with the Santa Clara Master Gardener Program, how to stay in touch with just the UC Master Gardener Program. Uh, you guys really wrapped up a great uh, virtual conference. I want to say thank you to each of you, Pam, Elizabeth, and Mildy, especially Jill in the background. We're not going to put you on camera, Jill. You can just be in the background, an awkward double hand wave, which is what I like to do. This has been a tremendous conference. We are happy to be able to share these projects and search for excellence winners with more people. If we were at our normal conference that happened in person, not a lot of people would have heard about this. And so we're, it's actually real positive to pull out of, out of what we are dealing with right now with the pandemic that guess what? More people saw your project. You have great kudos coming up. This is just an exciting, exciting thing. And um, I hope people are motivated to continue with their volunteer service, maybe to uh, motivated to get out in the garden or maybe even motivated to uh, take their kids with them out in the garden. And guess what? You you have me. I wrote down, I wanted to ask this question and I almost totally forgot. In your guys' opinion, what is the best time of year that I should plan to come visit Marshall Cottle Park? Like what is that peak time? Is it fall? Is it spring? Like when should I come? You really sold me on, um, on coming down to visit you guys and visit that park. Lauren, I'm going to say you can make it uh, Sunday, October 18th, you can actually come in. We are, we just had our first open garden since March, and um, you know we're we're doing it safe distancing, and so you can have an opportunity uh, to actually we're doing uh, self guided tours, and you can see the whole whole uh, or a lot of the demo gardens. Um, Pam and Milly, I'm not sure which ones you like, but uh, I guess I have a special a place in my heart, of course, is for the three sisters garden because I was 
the one who said, hey, I've got this idea in mind. What do you think? And uh, this is the second year we've done it. And we've just been astounded at uh, how successful we've become with it. So um, uh, that's my opinion. But any time is beautiful. You come in the spring and you can see all the wildflowers in our native and habitat gardens. And uh, Pam and Mildy also work on a pollinator garden. And it's probably it's so in bloom right now. Uh, a lot of the natives are kind of drying out, but but the pollinator garden is just just gorgeous. So, Pam, Mildy, what do you think? I think either time is great. I mean, there's always something blooming, and soon there'll be something to eat in the orchard every every month of the year. That's the idea. So, anytime you want to come, just come. It's great. Okay, so what I just took from this is that I need to come every season. <laughs> Well, that is great. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and end our live broadcast. And if you missed any of this, if you're like, what? It's the end of a of a nine sessions. Guess what? We recorded it all. You can watch this 20 times if you wanted to. It's on the UC, UC Master Gardener YouTube channel. I'll be posting that up before we leave. Uh, panel, you did a great job. You did really, really well. I appreciate you being here, being willing and open to talk about it. And your volunteer service is greatly appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Bye.